Hey, hey, everyone, it's Puts You to Sleep Reader, I mean Sleepy Reader, <laughs> here with a comic book countdown. Uh, my, com my thoughts on the 12 comics from last week that I read. So I'll rank them, I'll count them down. Um, purely subjective, even more subjective than your average quote reviewer. I um, uh, rank them in terms of my enjoyment at the time I read them, which could and it is definitely the case this time around there are comics that i know subjectively were better than the ones i ranked higher but i that's how i felt and my lowest ranked comic is actually a very well done comic but i didn't enjoy it so um today is new comic book day and i don't have time to go to my comic book shop i think i have time to do this but let's get started um so in at number 12 was coffin bound and i did indeed if you've been following me talking about wanting to drop this i did indeed drop this the moment after i read it um, i meant to drop it after issue two because i just knew it wasn't my kind of thing uh it gets even grosser here and i'm also even further confused by what's going on and what the premise really is um did our heroine sleep with her brother named cassandra or am i misremembering what happened in issue two because in this issue, we find out Cassandra's her brother, um, whose eyes she removed. Or, or maybe he removed his eyes to save her heart. Anyway, I'm not sure. Um, but that's Coffin Bound. I'm done with it. Uh, if anyone wants the first three issues, uh, let me know. I'll, I'll happily mail them to you. <clears throat> In at number 11 was Supergirl. I kind of anticipated that I wouldn't be able to read this with my daughter, and that was entirely true. And um, it's just totally caught up in Event Leviathan and whatever else. It says you're the villain on it, so maybe it's caught up in you're the villain. Maybe you're the villain and Event Leviathan are the same thing. I don't know. There was a few cool scenes but, you know, I have been reading Supergirl for, what number issue is this? Number 35. I've probably read at least the last, what, 10 or 15 issues, if not maybe 20 out of the 35 issues. I did not know various things that were referred to in here, including her, who this person was that she's so happy to see, and the fact that she suddenly has an anti-kryptonite suit. So all of that was kind of weird, but mostly you can't understand this, I guess. Maybe you can't understand it even if you have been reading the other Leviathan books. I don't know, but it, it's it's kind of a waste of your time if you just want a Supergirl book. And I'm just getting really annoyed that they never just have a Supergirl story for the sake of Supergirl and build up Supergirl as her own story. Uh, why put out comics that are just footnotes to other comics? It's no wonder to me that's the kind of this thinking in terms of the entire universe of DC as being more important than the individual comics is probably in the long run. It may occasionally sell comics, but in the long run, why their sales go down and down. And I think DC is having a lot of troubles right now and is talking about a major reboot yet again. And it's a universe reboot. Maybe just reboot some characters or something. Um, anyhow. <clears throat> Up next at number 10, really not so bad. So those first two were the ones, especially the one at number 12. But at number 10 is this extra fat villains giant, 100-page uh, villains giant, which had three new stories and then a bunch of reprints. And I haven't read all the reprints, I have to confess. So I'm basing my judgment on the originals. <coughs> and this... Um, this story on the Joker by um, by um, uh, what's his name by Mark Russell was the reason I bought this comic, and I just didn't I just didn't get into it very much. Um, the Joker is basically kind of trolling trolling the city and trolling Batman in a way, and I guess that should have been clever, but just somehow <coughs> the tone of it and everything. Even the, the artist who I normally think of as a good artist, I just didn't get into the way he was doing things, the way he did the Joker. So, um, so that kind of didn't work for me. 
Then there was kind kind of a, a death stroke story where Deathstroke gets um, it gets a uh, contracted to kill Jimmy Olsen, and of course it doesn't work out for him. At least in that story, maybe that's why I like this one better. We get a positive image of Supergirl um, briefly. So I mean, I as I said, only the first two. This was just kind of a weakish comic. I think basically for the moment I am dying off on DC. There's maybe two DC comics I want to get, uh, or maybe three, or maybe the third one is going away. There was this kind of fun Greg Pak story about Darkseid, which was a reprint probably from Villains Month back in the New 52. Uh, it was cool to read. It was odd because it had absolutely nothing to do with the original concept of Darkseid as presented in The New Gods by Jack Kirby, which I happen to have read recently for that podcast I do with, with Matt. So I was puzzled by that. Why would they throw out every, almost everything from the old New Gods? Maybe they thought they were reconfiguring re, uh, the story, but it seemed to me to, to take it really far away from, from where it originally came from. Although you end up with an evil dark side and an e a hellish apocalypse at the end anyway. So there's probably, and I, I should read the rest I think all the rest may be stuff from that Villains Month, reprints of Villains Month from the New 52. In at number nine is Copra number one. And don't be fooled, this is Copra number 32, and there's nothing in it that makes it a number one, except that now it's being published by Image instead of self-published by Michelle Fife. You can get all the trades, and they're kind of cool. Um, and this one, you know, I, I would say, well, to confess, I read the first 12 issues of Capra, maybe the first 16 issues of Capra, I'm not sure, I can't remember anymore, before I just started collecting it without, I was collecting the trades. I bought some single issues, then I bought the trades. And I was collecting the trades and haven't read the rest of the trades. Um, but from what I've read before, this is kind of a down issue, a less exciting issue. And often what's exciting about it, there's a few pages that do have this incredible visual inventiveness and all the wild and crazy characters. But Capra is always a little bit confusing to read. Maybe the visual storytelling, the, the visuals are really cool, but sometimes the visual storytelling doesn't connect the dots well enough for you. And there's so many characters to keep track of. Um, that it's hard to totally get into it. So I think if you're interested in Capra, uh, maybe pick up this issue, but maybe read some of the older trades and don't have too high expectations of this issue anyway. I, it was okay, but I actually had to put it down, come back to it, it was just too confusing. I wasn't in the mood, I was in, so part of what I like about comics is their ease of reading, the way the information flows into your brain from pictures and words together working really well. So Copper was at number nine. Kind of the last of the books that I have some complaints about uh, was Soft Wood, this new comic from Heavy Metal. Yes, so I didn't get that. or It really is just Heavy Metal, so they named this Soft Wood, but this is their sexualized humor magazine, and it the... They may have just been making a play on heavy metal, but the soft wood, it definitely is a wood softener, if you know what I mean. And uh, particularly the first two stories sort of put me in a very downer mood. The first one is called um, Camp Micro Penis, and it's just kind of sad, and I guess it's funny in kind of a dark way, and it tries to have a little bit of a lesson out of it. Um, and as you can see, it's kind of done, it looks like an indie comic. And this thing combines stuff you might expect from heavy metal with stuff you might expect from underground comics and from indie comics. Then the next thing was this series of haikus called Blue Haiku, which just, to me, the humor in the haikus just turned me off from a <laughs> sexual thing. So I was not, after reading that, um, you know, dripping anuses and such. I was not eager to read some more sexualized humor comics. But in fact, there were a lot of good things. The very next one uh, doesn't even involve sex. It's, it could have been in a regular heavy metal called Suicity. And it's a short 
very dark piece about how they treat suicides in this uh, dark future city. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then there's a lot of good one-shot cartoons mixed in here. Here's one from Shannon, Shannon Wheeler of um, Too Much Coffee Man fame. So, it's, as usual for an anthology thing, it was kind of a mixed bag. Like, this thing here really didn't do much for me. I didn't get the joke too much. There were these really good one-page cartoons that were scattered throughout called Jake Likes Onions by Jake Thomas. Okay, here's one that was just kind of, another one that was just kind of gross and a turnoff. So I don't know, you know, is it a more modern aesthetic to make sex kind of gross and a turnoff? There was more, so then there was this um, spoof on The Watchmen, which, it's just really hard to read, and after it's just the way it was written was hard to read, even though it imitated Alan Moore, and the lettering was hard to take in, and the way the characters talked. But eventually you realized it was all about um, Spotty rather than Rorschach, uncovering a mystery about what the publishing industry has done to Alan Moore. Um, I guess I just spoiled that. So, um, and it goes on and on and on. So it's kind of a clever idea. It actually is colored by the original Watchmen colorist, which really surprised me, John Higgins. Uh, but I don't really recommend reading it. Uh, if, you know, unless you feel you have to read everything. There are these interesting ones drawn by Rafer Roberts, and I forget who the writer was. Rafer Roberts I experienced as a writer on um, Archer and Armstrong. What else was there? You know, there, there wasn't the reason it's kind of it's in the bottom of my pile is it there, there was enough there was a lot of not very strong stuff or just annoying stuff there was that uh, occasional pieces that were gross outs and there were some things that were mildly funny um, or mildly clever and then there were these there were the shorter things that I really liked and one of the big standouts if I now can find where I went because um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Oh, come on, I'm a sleepy reader. Come on, Damon. There we go. Evan Dorkin had these comic strips in the middle of the magazine, and these were the very best part of the comic, and they were very much like underground comics, and I really enjoyed these. So uh, th this was the highlight. So it's kind of weird to rate this. The Evan Dorkin stuff might have been up near the top of my pile, but there was so much stuff that was, would be in the middle or the bottom that I had to make this sort of near the top of the bottom, <laughs> if you wanna. And I don't mean a sexual joke by that, Mr. Softwood. Um, so there you go. I thought, so that was, then in at number seven is Edgar Allan Poe's Snifter of Terror. And I thought from previous issues that I'd read, this is number one of volume two. Um, and it just continues, I think exactly like volume one with a, a assortment of stories. <clears throat> but so I was expecting this to be way at the top, but it was kind of, it, they devoted most of the issue to this one story by Dean Motter of Mr. X fame. Um, I haven't read anything by Dean Motter in ages, at least I don't think so. And I didn't even remember what his artwork looked like. I didn't think it looked like this, but maybe it always did and I've just forgotten. Um, this was a story that was almost really cool. It was a story about Edgar Allan Poe committing a crime and wanting revenge on someone, and it combined all kinds of elements from his famous story. So it should have been really good, but it just kind of lay flat there. So that's kind of the risk of going with one story for the issue rather than a bunch in one of these anthology things. Then we had some poems, which were okay. I, I, they weren't too Edgar Allan Poe-ish a kind of cool story called Voodoo Burger, and then a cartoon from Hunt Emerson about Edgar Allan Poe and the, and the Raven, uh, which wasn't enough to save the issue, and it was okay. Um, it wasn't like the best Hunt Emerson ever. So anyway, that's why I put this one at number seven. Coming in at, Gren at number six was Grendel, for me, as a, a reminder, all of this is um, <clears throat> objective. 
<clears throat> sorry, subjective, super subjective. Uh, it just, there were some interesting things in this Grendel story and I enjoyed seeing Matt Wagner's art. It felt, it felt like we were in indie comics from the late eighties or something. And I enjoyed that, um, nice coloring by his son and, and lots of cool little bits, but the story overall didn't grab me a whole lot. And it's, it feels like it's going to be a very kind of abstract sci-fi story with Grendel looking for a planet to revive the human, to, uh, what's the word? The seeds of the human race, or at least of the Grendel family, um, to be reborn on another planet. He's looking for a planet to seed with their genetic material. So um, <clears throat> I think he's some kind of robot or android or cr artificial creation. I'm not sure. I. I don't know that I read the later Grendel books. Anyway, it was kind of cool. I'm definitely going to get the whole series, and I had fun reading it, but it it didn't, like, blow my mind or anything. <clears throat> and the last book, kind of the top of the middle, was The Batman's Graveyard. And <clears throat> it just, it I can't tell what kind of story it is yet. It's It basically establishes that um, there's already a grave waiting for Batman when he dies for Bruce Wayne to be next to his parents and that uh, Alfred thinks that will be pretty soon and um, There's lots of cool art by Brian Hitch But I found myself not a super fan of his scenes of Batman fighting and stuff They felt stiff and, and suddenly I thought well, maybe Brian Hitch is not the best the most ideal sort of Batman artist. He's too grand and cinematic and I don't know. <clears throat> but I'm not complaining a whole lot. Uh, any of the scenes that weren't sort of fighting action scenes I really enjoyed, like just Alfred and Bruce sitting around talking. But so the jury's out whether, for me, whether uh, Warren Ellis, whether this is going to be one of those really good Warren Ellis stories or one that he's just kind of writing with his left hand while he uh, cashes the check with his right hand. <clears throat> Shooting up higher in my esteem. So all the remaining comics, starting with number four, are were favorites. I really enjoyed reading them. I really look forward to reading more. And, um, and yeah, they were, hey, comics are great. And so Oblivion Song, number 20, I actually read 19 and 20 together. And <clears throat> so I maybe was well influenced by how good 19 was also. Because <clears throat> 19 really turns the corner, I feel, on a, in Oblivion Song towards a more horrific story. And <laughs> while I'm complaining about the horror in Coffin, uh, What's the full name of Coffin? Sorry, uh, Coffin Bound. While I'm complaining about the horror in Coffin Bound, um, Oblivion Song is horror that really grabs me and really does horrify me and enriches the, uh, the created world that uh, Robert Kirkman and his artistic team, again, with the amazing colors, uh, and his artistic team are building for us. Um, so I just can't wait for the next issue. I still have the complaint of it's not always easy to tell who all the different characters are and keep track of them. Um, <clears throat> so I wish there was more character tagging, so to speak, both in name and maybe just saying something about them, like he's the explorer, he's the scientist, whatever. Uh, remind us every now and then who he's the general, she's the assistant, I don't know. Um, she's the wife, she's the boss. Uh, but anyway, other than that, these, these were some great issues and I'm really enjoying Oblivion Song. Much to my surprise, I mean, I, I kind of don't think of my, I think of myself as someone who likes Robert Kirkman but doesn't love Robert Kirkman. Um, <clears throat> but it's clearly a team effort. Ice Cream Man, um, as always, Ice Cream Man overall is my top comic of the last year or two years, however long it's been, probably a year and a half now, because it's come out pretty steadily. 
and we have this crazy story of a woman apparently going insane, perhaps purposely being driven insane by the ice cream man, or maybe it's just the genetics of her family. But it's really creepy. I mean, the, the horror of that you might go insane and horrible, the world becoming a horror show all around you is really captured well here. The art and the color are beautiful. I mean, the, the only thing I've never loved in Ice Cream Man is the lettering. Um, it's not too bad here. It's when they do captions and stuff, and there isn't a lot of captions, if any, in this one. <clears throat> There's no reason why it ranked a little lower, ranking in at number three. Everything was really close, but um, it is I, I, ironic because we're getting close to Halloween. I am a little less excited by horror right now than by other things. <clears throat> so, well, I suppose this could be horror in its own way. At number two, an another book that if I had to create a top five of books I'm reading right now, this would definitely be in it, uh, Yusagi Yojimbo. So clearly I was an idiot never to read it when it was in black and white, but I'm going to stick with my just reading it in color because uh, my brain just works better with this artwork when it's in color. But this was uh, the second of a two-parter. And um, you can definitely, from what I can see, you can, any one that says part one of two, you can start, or part one of three, they do not connect. Con they're totally standalone stories within those two or three parts or four parts or what have you. Um, and this one is a beautifully sad story about a marriage in Japan that um, Usagi gets kind of involved with. In a way, Usagi is like Conan. He's traveling the land. He encounters other people's adventures, other people's things. He passes through them. He's involved. We get an interesting story a piece. Usagi, though, is sensitive, unlike Conan. I mean, Conan has his own sensitivity, I suppose. But Usagi is, has a sense of honor and sensitivity, and he's definitely, as far as I know, part of this Japanese culture in the medieval ages that's being presented here. So it gives us these, these fantasy, sometimes human, sometimes, even though they're funny animals, stories. So this, and they don't overplay the emotion, and I really like that. The emotion is there, but it's not overplayed. You can bring the emotion with you. Um, it's not forced on you. Um, and I just really like the style of, of this and of the way this story was. This was, now I'm wanting to put this at number one to tell you the truth as I think about it. Because <coughs> my number one is really silly. Um, but anyway, so I thought this was brilliant, the two, this two-parter. Then I put it number one in when I was making my stack, Batman Universe by Brian Michael Bendis and Nick Darrington. And a lot, I just had a lot of fun reading it. In the previous issues, because um, each issue is made up of two parts, <coughs> in the previous issues, each part took place in a different environment, like on the planet Ran or um, Gorilla City or what have you. This one is mostly involving Batman and Green Lantern's time travel to the time of Jonah Hex. They encounter Jonah Hex, then they encounter Randall Savage, and Vandal Savage. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. Nick Darrington really makes most of um, Brian Michael Bendis' kind of sense of humor really work way more than it does when they use kind of a traditional comic book artist, in my opinion. And um, he, he really adds so much. And you, and you can't complain about having uh, Dave Stewart colors on a mainstream comic. So it just looks beautiful. And, um, it, you know, Nick Darrington as kind of the, the, the artist, as the actor and director and cinematographer of the script, he does all of those jobs really well, with some cinematography help, of course, from the colorist. So, um, and the fact that Brian Michael Bendis is not trying to be too fancy here, he's just trying to tell a fun story. It's not tied in with lots of bigger things and all of that brings out, for me, Bendis' strengths rather than his weaknesses that I find in a lot of other DC comics that he's doing. So I just had a darn good time, and that's what I wanted from comics, and so this was the comic I had the most fun reading this week.
<clears throat> and it's to be continued. Um, <clears throat> supposedly Batman is dead at the end of the issue. Of course, we know he's not, but it says, you know, coming next R.I.P. Batman, which I assume might be a play on the Grant Morrison R.I.P. Batman. Batman. So anyway, overall, a lot of enjoyment at the top of this stack. Um, I had a really good time. So I don't, I probably pick up my new comics tomorrow. I hope to continue getting, doing these uh, countdowns and doing them a little more like Sunday or Monday rather than Wednesday again, but we'll see. Life has been fraught. Talk to you later.